Good morning. This is the Keeping It Real Sunday School class from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Richland, Missouri. I'm Dr. Max Thornsberry, and I'm the teacher, and my wife, Brenda, will be reading the scriptures from the authorized version, the original King James Version of the Bible. We're going to be looking in our lesson today about the Great Commission, what our responsibility is as Christians. You know, um, Jesus said, greater things will you do than me. Jesus was stayed within about 150 miles. We're going to spread this gospel throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it. So we're going to look at the Great Commission that Christ has given the church in Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to read 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Now remember we discussed last week that only Mark and Luke and Acts have the ascension of Christ. Matthew doesn't have it. John doesn't have it. Uh, Luke has it twice in his gospel and the book Acts. Probably the best um, description of the ascension is in Acts chapter 1. Why do you stand looking here, men, gazing here, gazing up? Uh, though just like Jesus is gone, he shall return again. And uh, Matthew doesn't give us the ascension at all. This um, great commission is given to the apostles um, in Galilee. And I want to just spend a little bit of time on it. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And yet we're going to read verses here in a minute uh, out of the book of Acts that says we are to baptize in the name of Jesus. Which one's correct? Both. Yeah, both. The other thing is, Jesus says, All power and all authority has been given unto me. Let's go to Paul's writing in Colossians chapter 1. And uh, we're going to go, no, we're going to go to Colossians chapter 2. I'll go back to 1 here in a minute and read verse 10. Colossians chapter 2, two verse, verse 10. Verse 10, okay. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now Paul makes it very evident. One of my favorite parts of the book of Colossians is you are complete in him. We don't need anything else. He completes us. Mm -hmm. And then he says at the end of that, that, read that again. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So the Lord Jesus Christ has been given all authority in heaven and earth. And then just flip right back a little bit to Colossians chapter 1 and read verse 15 through 20. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of, all, firstborn of all creation? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So the Apostle Paul is very poignant, very um, succinct, but very solidly impressing on the Colossians that the Lord Jesus Christ has all power and authority in heaven and earth. One of the problems with the Colossians is they were falling to this mystic Jewish teaching that angels had more power and authority than Jesus did because Jesus was a man. Well, he was a man, but he was also God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And notice he says, all things were created by him 
and for him, mm -hmm. and by him all things consist. Mm -hmm. yep. He holds together the whole universe. Mm -hmm. Everything is dependent upon him. Now, we sometimes just read over this, I've been given all power and all authority, and it doesn't really sink into us. Uh, he's got authority over dominions, over powers, over authorities, over principles, over everything. In the realm of heaven, in the realm of hell, everywhere in between, mm -hmm. he has full, complete power and authority. And as we read last week, the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians that there will come a day when every knee will bow mm -hmm. and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether they want to or not, they're going to do that. Yep. Um, we're going to give him the uh, adoration and the recognition. Now, Brendan, we're going to go to some uh, little bit con confrontational, I guess you could say, certainly controversial portions of Scripture that we're going to read out of the book of Acts. And we're going to read concerning uh, baptizing in the name of Jesus, but in the process we're also going to address baptizing. Now it is important for us to understand that we have uh, taken a Greek term, baptismal, and we incorporated it into English, transliteration mm -hmm. of the word. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any word for baptism in English, so we just kept the Greek word. It means to totally immerse in water, mm -hmm. not to sprinkle, not to pour, although we have a lot of denominations that have adapted. We as Baptists always completely immersed a person. Mm -hmm. When the Baptists really began to be prominent in England, uh, Luddites and others, but Baptists in particular during the Protestant Reformation. Before then, if you weren't Catholic, they killed you, and after that, if you weren't Episcopalian, the Church of England, they killed you. But eventually, there was a little more tolerance. You need to read Fox's Book of Martyrs to come to a full understanding of how many people were martyred just because they wouldn't bow down to the Pope or they wouldn't bow down to the King of England. When Baptists really began to come out in the open, it is said that literally tens of thousands of people would come to the River Thames to watch them baptize because they'd never seen anyone actually baptized. Mm -hmm. They'd always been sprinkled or a little water poured on them. When we baptize, we put them under the water mm -hmm. and we bring them back out. Yes. Um, that's what baptism means. That's why we have the term Baptist applied to us, among other reasons. Mm -hmm. The other is that we do not believe that baptism is essential for salvation. It is an outward symbol of an inward change. Brenda, do we believe that people should be baptized? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Do we baptize our children when they confess Christ? Of course. Do we baptize older people when they confess Christ? Yes. Um, what if someone makes a deathbed confession but can't get baptized? They're still saved and going to heaven. What about the good thief on the cross, relative good? <laughs> yeah. At least he acknowledged Christ as Lord Absolutely. and was saved. And he went to paradise with him. Did he? Was he able to be baptized? Uh, no. Okay. Is did Christ need to be baptized in order to be Christ? Of course not. John the Baptist never baptized people for salvation. He always baptized people to show repentance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm making a change in my life. It was an outward symbol of an inward change. Mm -hmm. That's how he got his name, John the Baptist. That's how he ministered. Um, Jesus himself, the Bible says, never baptized anyone. Mm -hmm. The disciples baptized, mm -hmm. but he never baptized anyone. Mm -hmm. Remember, John's disciples were a little bit jealous and said, everybody's following after Jesus. Yeah. And John said... Imagine that. John said, he must increase, I must decrease. Mm -hmm. um, so now let's go to Acts chapter 2 and read verse 38. 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we know that the Holy Spirit comes on people at the moment of salvation. These people are being preached to here because of the day of Pentecost. Do you want this Holy Spirit to be on you like it is on us? Then you're going to have to repent and take Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to go back at a similar, he's preaching to the Sanhedrin this time, to Acts chapter 3 and read verse 19. Now this is the same Peter preaching. Acts 3.19 Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So what is it that brings about salvation? Repentance. Repentance, not baptism. No, repentance. Baptism is what we do as an outward symbol to the spirit world, to the world around us, um, for ourselves, for those other Christians that are in witnessing it. Mm-hmm. But it's repentance that brings salvation. Yes. Baptism is a symbol. Do we get baptized? Absolutely. Is it necessary to be baptized? Absolutely. But baptism does not save us. We'll read some other verses here. Now, we're in great um, disagreement with other denominations on that point. Mm -hmm. um, there are denominations that keep the baptistry full all the time so that they can... As soon as you confess Christ, they run and baptize you in case you might die before you get baptized. Sometimes we're a little lax on that as Baptists. We were when I was younger because the creeks would be froze over mm -hmm. for several months. Yep. So you might confess Christ, come before the church, acknowledge your salvation, but it might be four months before the water was warm enough to take you to the creek. Now mm -hmm. we have baptistries in the church. Ours has even got a heater on it. Mm -hmm and we can baptize people fairly quickly. We don't want to let it be lax, no. but we also don't want to assign to it more than it is. Exactly. And we'll read some other verses to back that up. All right, who do they baptize in the name of who? Acts 2.38. In the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 8.16, we're going to work our way through here. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And again, who are they baptized and whose name are they baptized? The Lord Jesus. Acts 10.48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then asked they him to tarry certain days. And whose name are they baptized? Jesus. Acts 19.5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, Brenda, what is the deal here. Jesus, he says, go to the ends of the earth, Jerusalem first, all Samaria, and the entire earth, all nations, he says. So this is not limited to just Jewish people. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How come they're not following through on that? How come the first century church did not baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, uh, the Holy Spirit didn't come until Jesus ascended. That is so, true. He came in on the time of Pentecost, but all these baptisms are after that. Uh, I don't have a good reference for that. The Bible tells us we're to be baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but yet the early church is baptized in the name of Jesus. I don't know that it became a custom to baptize in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit until sometime later. Our lesson writer says you can start seeing it written in certain things about the middle of the second century, 200s somewhere, where they're now baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't know if they just left out part of it because they're wanting to emphasize, you know, Luke is writing this for Theopolis, who might be the judge for the Apostle Paul, 
could be a lawyer for the Apostle Paul when he stands before Pharaoh, which unfortunately is Nero, who's nuttier than a fruitcake, um, drinking wine and taking lead acetate in every day from leaden vessels and nutter, nuttier than a fruitcake, stabbed himself in the, like that in the jaw to kill himself. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have all the answers for that. But I think that it's probably good that we obey what Christ said to do. And although Christ is part of the Trinity, notice that we read out of Colossians, Brenda, that He is the head of the God. He is the head of the Godhead. He is 100% man, 100% God. Uh, you can baptize in Jesus' name, but Jesus asked you to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is what the church does today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 12, even that's not in our lesson, because I think it's important we have this set up. We have talked about the fact that salvation is for all nations, the Jew first and then the Greek. We have talked about taking this message out, and Jesus said even until the end of the world, even until uh, Christ's second coming, there's still going to be people saved even after His second coming in glory, a thousand year reign. We're going to keep preaching Jesus. We're going to be emphasizing Jesus. They're going to be offering livestock in the new temple that's going to be built after Jesus returns and sets on the throne of David to shed blood, to demonstrate Christ, what He paid for sin. Um, and people are going to be born in that time period, and they're going to exercise their free will because Satan's going to be turned loose a little later. And then he's going to raise a great army that choose to follow him instead of Jesus, even after Jesus is set on the throne a thousand years. So this message is going to keep being preached right up until the end, which is going to occur at the end of the thousand-year reign. Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 12, and read through 19. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them who glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be of sober mind, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead, and that he died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new." And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their tras trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, I had you read all of that in order to set up the part in verse 16. It says, Wherefore, henceforth... No, we, no man after the flesh. What do you think he means by the flesh here, Brenda? Humanity. Yeah, you know, the worldly system of humanism, mm -hmm. basically, is what he's talking about. Um, that Christ has come to put that worldly system under his thumb with all power and authority and establish himself as reconciliation for our sin. And notice he said, so that none of the trespasses that are in our life will be held against us. And that we then are to be committed to this word of reconciliation. Now that means it's important for us to teach what Christ's sacrifice has actually provided. Mm -hmm. Now we talk about the three Cation words in theology, Brenda. Justification is what he's talking about right here. He's talking about we're justified in Christ just as if we never sinned. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. because of what he did. But there are other Cation words we have to deal with. One of those is sanctification, and we're going to look at some verses about that. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Ephesians that we're created unto good works. I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and read verse 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before, hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So our salvation is by grace, because of what Christ has done. We must put our faith and trust in him. We're going to look in Romans chapter 10 here in just a minute defines exactly how we do that. And uh, then good works are to follow. Mm -hmm. That is a process we call sanctification, meaning we are getting sanctified for God's service. It's a lifelong deal. You're never fully sanctified. Mm -hmm. But in the process of living from the point of salvation to the point of death, we should be growing in our understanding. The Holy Spirit should be working more with us. Holy Spirit convicts us sin, points to righteousness in Jesus Christ. We accept that righteousness. We receive our salvation. And then the Holy Spirit empowers us to live in this worldly, fleshly system that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be in that all the time, but we're in it right now. Mm -hmm. um, I would like you to turn to Romans 10 and read verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So how does a person get saved? Well, we go to second, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Why don't you go read that for us? It's one of my, we read verse almost every Sunday, but okay. I think it's uh, 12. I, First Corinthians? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. I'm doing that by memory, I don't, but I know it's going to be right. I made a mistake one time, but I was mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, the book of John tells us, and points to righteousness in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit never speaks of himself, but always points to Jesus. That conviction is necessary for salvation. Mm -hmm. You can't obtain salvation and just say, I'm going to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Or I like Jesus' teachings. Or Jesus was a great man. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's not how it works. It's not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so then we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ was indeed raised from the dead mm -hmm. and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. That's the simple process and people cannot believe, cannot comprehend, will not accept that it's that easy. No. Now, with that, there is danger. If you don't respond to the Holy Spirit, the Apostle John tells us in 1 John chapter 5 that there is a sin we need not pray for, and that is the unpardonable sin, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, where we reject, 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 and He eventually withdraws. Mm -hmm. Now, we've said before, if you're worried about committing that sin, you haven't committed it. Mm -hmm. Because when you commit it, you'll be oblivious. Yeah. I don't know when that is. Does the Holy Spirit try 10,000 times? Does He try a million times? That's up to Him. Mm -hmm. That's His decisions to make. Now, the Apostle Paul says, all things are become new. Turn to Revelation 21 and read verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now this is Christ sitting on the throne of David, starting the thousand-year reign. 
And he says, I make all things new. The Apostle Paul says, all things are become new whenever we take Christ as our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. That we become a new creation, a new creature in Christ. Yet, it seems to me like some of my old traits and my old habits and my old emotions are still around. Mm -hmm. now, why is that? Does that mean this scripture is not true? No. No. We're going, <laughs> we're going through a process of a sanctification. sanctification. Yeah. That's right. You don't become instantly perfect, sinless person when you take Christ as Lord and Savior. All right, we're going to finish up, Brenda, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 20 and 21. And this should be a uh, familiar verse to those of us who were royal ambassadors as young boys in uh, Baptist churches. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We beg you in Christ's stead that you be reconciled to God. For he hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. While we were yet sinners, the Apostle Paul writes, Christ died for us. Um, what do you think of when you think of the word ambassador? A representative. That's what I think of. Okay. I tell the story, and Jessica's not going to like it, so I'm going to go back to Haiti. Okay. The only time I was ever in an embassy, mm -hmm. had to renew my visa to stay in Haiti for longer than three months. I go up to the embassy, and there stands two big Marines with AR six with uh, M4, AR-16, standing there. Plead attention. Don't look at you. Don't say nothing to them. And when you step across the threshold... There's a sign in the floor and all the walls says you are now, you are now in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Well, that felt pretty good. Yeah. That felt pretty good. <laughs> so you go to the ambassador's office, you present your paperwork, they give you a visa which makes you legal mm -hmm. to stay in Haiti for another three months. Mm -hmm. Um. It's kind of like this. When we cross the threshold into Christianity, taking Christ our Lord and Savior, the Apostle Paul says we are aliens in a foreign land. Mm -hmm. It's like that ambassador sitting in his big fancy office there in that embassy. He's a foreigner in Haiti. Mm -hmm. But when he's in that embassy, he's in the United, United States. States of America. And it's very similar... We're in the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. and yet we're aliens sojourning through a foreign land. Mm -hmm. Just like outside of that embassy, I, I'm still a citizen of the United States, but I'm not in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what he's trying to impress upon them. They understand what ambassadors are. Uh, they understand that countries communicate with other countries through embassies and ambassadors. It's uh, almost not possible for us to comprehend it if we haven't been to an embassy. You know, I, I recited this 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. I don't know. I'm going to say a thousand times. Every RA meeting we had, we recited it. It was in all our literature. Um, I didn't have any idea what an ambassador was until I went to Haiti and stepped into the United States. And I understand more clearly what the Apostle Paul says. I'm an alien mm -hmm. sojourning through a foreign land. Mm -hmm. That's got to be our attitude. Yeah. This is not our home. No. This is not our country. Our country is in the heavenlies. Mm -hmm. Our home is in heaven mm -hmm. with Christ as our Savior and Advocate and Lawyer. The propitiation for my sins, a substitute for everything I've ever done wrong. Mm -hmm. The blood of Jesus covers me. When I stand at the throne, God can't see me. Mm -hmm. All He sees is the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Do you understand that term, ambassador? Yeah. Think about the significance of that. In this world, we are what people see of Jesus. 
Yeah, sometimes that's very unfortunate. <laughs> sometimes it is. We're not the best, no. um, but it's how he's chosen to operate. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul has a way of putting that into words. If I had not gone into that embassy, I would have not understood this verse, the extent that I understand it today. If we could understand why the Lord has put it in our hands to do greater things than He did, taking the, you know, he's, He operated the 150 mile distance between Galilee and Jerusalem, Galilee and Jerusalem, over to the Dead Sea, over to the Mediterranean Sea, to Caesarea uh, Philippi and Caesarea Maritima. But a pretty narrow circle, Brenda. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more than 150 miles from here to Kirksville. Mm -hmm. Be like from here to Moberly. Mm -hmm. And that's all he ever operated in. So he says, you'll do greater things than I. We're going to take this gospel. We're going to take it across the world. We may not be able to do it personally, but we can do it through the cooperative program, do it through helping other people that have been called to that. We can do things ourselves, like we can go to Haiti, we can go to Mexico, we can go to Cuba. We've got all kinds of places in the world that Baptists are very active in, other churches are active in. We then become ambassadors of Christ wherever we go. And I, 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 think, I think that needs to sink in a little bit we usually think of it in terms of a governing person or someone that's the head person at the embassy, but we are all ambassadors for Christ. Yeah. You don't have to be a pastor, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher. We're all ambassadors for Christ. We are aliens sojourning through a foreign world, war, through a foreign land, and this is not our home. Let that sink in. Last verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Read that again. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now what is this, Brenda? All men? Yeah. He would have all men to be saved? And if, come to the knowledge of the truth? Well, that's what it says. Is all underlined? Is it got quotations around it? It's just a simple all. So what does all mean? Everybody. Is it similar to John 3.16 where Christ himself says, Whosoever? Whosoever. Yes, very similar. I don't know. We have denominations that do not believe that. They believe that God has chosen who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost before the foundation of the world. Yet we have Peter himself saying it is God's will that all come to a saving knowledge, that all repent. Now, does it mean that all will be saved? Of course not. Does it mean that all will repent? No. No, it doesn't. Narrow is the way. Mm-hmm. But it does mean that everyone should have an opportunity. Exactly. And our responsibility is to make sure that everybody does have an opportunity to take this great commission that Christ has given to the church and to recognize that our real goal in life is not to entertain people, but to demonstrate who Christ is, present the gospel in a simple, straightforward manner, and to make sure that people understand without Christ you're going to be separated from God by eternity. We said last week there's something God can't do. He can't lie. Mm -hmm. There's also something else He can't do. He cannot judge inappropriately. God is no respecter of persons. The only thing that brings us eternal life is the blood of Jesus. If God sees that blood, He doesn't see us. Mm -hmm. Thank God Almighty. Mm -hmm. For sure. See you next week.